So I'm just going to the top of the chat here. I'm working my way down. Um, so Odile asked the first question, and this is to Ray. What is happening with the Middle East weapons of mass destruction free zone? Yeah, um, so there was a conference in November 2019 um, that brought all of the governments of the region together, um, except Israel boycotted along with the US. Um, that adopted, had like an outcome declaration and the intention is to hold another conference that will advance these issues. Um, but due to COVID, uh, the dates for that, as far as I know, have not been firmly established. So um, we'll probably know more coming out of this first committee because uh, there will be another resolution that will advance that process at the first committee. Um, but that's the intention is to, is to host a second conference. There's also been a lot of work on the activist side around um, the establishment of a WMD free zone in the Middle East. Um, the establishment of the METO organization, Middle East Treaty Organization, which um, is sort of co-run by an Israeli and an Iranian activist. Um, they're doing a lot of work to keep up pressure and do analysis and advocacy that's relevant to helping advance that issue. So I'd encourage you to check out um, their website, the METO meto.org, I think. But um, if you just type in Middle East Treaty Organization, you can you can find it. Do you have the declaration on your site that the conference in 2019 produced? Yes, that would be linked on our site. It would take me a minute to find it, but that would be that would be there. I'll try and find it as other questions are going on and I'll put it in the chat. Okay, so then uh, Mary Beth Gardam, another Wolf member has this relatively long question. I'll read it out. My question is about the concerns we have about the corporization of the UN, the way that US corporations, big agriculture, big pharma, big defense are influencing uh, the UN and diminishing the voices of other people at the grassroots uh, level, food security, trade, arms trade, the big corporations she feels are having too much influence. So where is Wilf on this? And how can we support efforts to decolonize the UN? Uh, Ray? Um, yes, I also saw there was another question from Nancy Price further down that's on this same thing. So how can the influence of corporations at the UN be monitored so that the SDGs are not realized exclusively through corporate privatization in the public sector. Um, so I don't know, Genevieve, if you want to tackle that, given that you've been following SDGs more, um, I can say to start that um, Wilt has been critical of corporate influence at the UN. Um, we are, of course, also an anti-capitalist organization. And so that's part of our um, our sort of advocacy or perspective on anti-militarist issues and on women, peace and security issues um, that are really important to bring into the discussion as well. Um, in the disarmament sphere, we work directly against corporate influence um, through the divestment work that I talked about already, um, but also in terms of, of arms trade by critiquing the corporations that are making profits off of the international arms trade um, and the ways in which their actions influence government policy in many cases. Um, so we've been active with a lot of groups at national levels like Campaign Against Arms Trade in the UK is super active on holding the UK government to account for its arms sales um, and uh, UK weapon producers. Um, and so we do that kind of both internationally at the UN and then where possible working with with uh, national organizations to counter those types of influences. But yeah, I don't know if you have anything to add on that, Jenna. Yeah, I can add a little bit. Um, and I'll also say that the uh, the human rights program of Wolf also does work on corporations and human rights. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's that's also another place to go. They uh, they have resources on that um, because that's part of their work. Um, I think, yeah, I, it's I will ditto everything that 
uh, that Ray said about um, the importance of anti-capitalism to Wolf's work, um, and we have been extremely critical of this kind of corporate influence. I think it's also staggering, you know, the the difference in terms of the space that's allocated to civil society in terms of like all of us. Um, and the space that we have to advocate, the space that we have um, both on the sidelines and in the official meetings to, to speak, to criticize, to um, deliver statements and hold um, governments accountable versus the space that corporations have. And I think sustainable development is a huge space that has been massively co-opted. And um, the, yeah, the women's major group has been very, uh, very vocal about this particular issue because um, yeah, there are many, Many of the panelists, for example, uh, at the sustainable development panels that will be on a topic such as food security will be like big banks or uh, big agriculture. Um, and I think that that's uh, just extremely ironic and the opposite of what was what, you know, many of us would want and uh, are intending by um, by our advocacy. What meanwhile, um, so they're, they're the ones who are like sometimes moderating the panels or who have, you know, 10 minutes to talk and uh, give their perspectives, but then all of the civil society groups, um, there's like, a, you know, the women's major group, the LGBTI um, stakeholder group, the indigenous peoples major group, um, the elders, like all of these groups have to fight for the same two minutes, basically, um, <laughs> at the end. Um, and so sometimes the moderator will call in a random group. Um, and uh, I think that that, uh, that difference in terms of who gets to participate and have their voice heard is, uh, is kind of staggering. Okay, thank you. Uh, so now moving down the chat uh, box here. Uh, so Valentine has asked, Ray, can you provide an example or two of how Wilf and or the coalitions you've mentioned might have helped a policy issue? She saw that at the Beijing conference, uh, she saw that happening at the Beijing conference, but war, peace and security issues are rather more difficult. Are there some governments that have been consistently more amenable to partnerships and cooperation? Question for Ray. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so um, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons is an example that I already gave. Um, we didn't just help that policy issue, we were instrumental in creating new international law. So I think that that is uh, one of the best examples we have. Um, we were also active in the negotiation of the arms trade treaty, uh, which of course was challenging for Wilf because we are opposed to the arms trade um, and the manufacture and sale of weapons altogether. Um, so when we were participating in the negotiation of that treaty at the UN, uh, we wanted to be careful to hold on to that um, position uh, while articulating good language for the treaty, which was about regulating the international arms trade. Um, but one of the things that we focused on was including the prevention of gender-based violence in the treaty as a legally binding obligation to make sure that governments were looking at the risk of gender-based violence um, when, they were, uh, when they were making arms transfer decisions. Um, and so there was already, of course, going to be language around human rights violations and violations of international humanitarian law. But in WILF, we really wanted to make sure that the wide range of gender-based um, violences would be taken into account. And so uh, we pushed for that uh, together with the Women's Network of the International Action Network on Small Arms, IANSA. And we managed to succeed in getting that into the treaty. At the beginning of the process, at the beginning of negotiations, um, most countries were asking us what gender-based violence had to do arms trade. And um, throughout the seven-year process to get the treaty, by the end, we had over 100 countries supporting its inclusion as a legally binding obligation. So I think that's a really good, um, solid example of how we advanced a, a policy issue. Um, but more broadly than that, I think also just the changes that we've seen in the disarmament space around some of the issues that Genevieve was talking about in terms of women's participation 
and considerations of gendered impacts of weapons, for example, um, that's been really taken up by the international disarmament community. In many ways, uh, it has been co-opted the way that Genevieve has described, um, or it's been watered down. So, you know, it's just about adding women to the table and it doesn't have any bearing on what the actual discussion is about weapons or changing the perspective or making, you know, an anti-militarist feminist perspective more credible in these spaces. But we've seen that start to change um, over very slowly over time. Um, and I think we'll see that increasingly change and adapt and, and new governments are taking up this as an issue and um, work is being done to, um, to incorporate considerations of gender diversity, as well as gender perspectives and gendered impacts of weapons and war. So those are some examples. Um, and then the second part of this question was on what governments are more amenable to partnerships. So this can change over time if a government um, changes due to an election. Um, but what we found uh, is that consistently through banning cluster bombs and landmines and nuclear weapons, we have found that there's sort of um, a core group of countries that are uh, really willing to work with civil society and view activists as being partners in disarmament work. Um, so those include, for example, Austria and Ireland um, and Mexico, um, uh, South Africa. Um, so these are, these are governments that have been champions of all these humanitarian disarmament bans um, and have worked with activists to make those happen. Okay, well that, uh, that was useful to get the names of those, uh, at least those four countries. Um, so Nancy is asking about, uh, let's see. So we, here in the US, uh, we've got people working on, as we say, moving the money out of the military budget into uh, education and healthcare. And so, is I can does I can have that approach as well about changing military budgets, reducing them and using the money elsewhere? Is I can taking that approach? Yes. So I can for years has um, been running the Don't Bank on the Bomb uh, project, which looks at all of the nuclear weapon producing companies all over the world, not just in the U.S. but including the U.S and all of the financial um, institutions and government budgets that are investing in these producers. And so um, it's, use, it's a really useful resource to use if you want to undertake an action in your city or with your own bank or your pension fund or whatever other financial institution that you engage with. Um, you can see where they invest and you can ask them to divest their money um, or tell them that if they don't, then you're going to move your money somewhere else. So yeah, ICANN's been doing that work uh, for many, many years now, well before we even had the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, we started that work. And so that, uh, I believe I've been to that organization's website. So if, if people Google don't bank on the bomb, they'll come up with a, a specific website. And I know it's, as you say, got lots of resources. Okay. So that one of our uh, attendees, has put a, a message to you, Ray, about appearing on a podcast. So I'm going to let you work with her. Uh, Lib Libby, you need to give an email address to Ray uh, through the private chat so she can contact you, okay? All right, then coming back down, uh, Valentina has another question. Genevieve, what would you say are the main obstacles you face in your advocacy work? Sure. So um, as, as I mentioned earlier, I don't focus quite as much on advocacy as my colleague, Zareen, who is the program manager. Um, but I, I think that there, one aspect is definitely that there is, um, among some Security Council members, for, for example, there is outward hostility, I think, to um, the issues that are part of the Women, Peace and Security agenda, including outward hostility to women's participation, um, and especially to the participation of women who are going to challenge, uh, challenge their, um, their norms and challenge militarism. Um, I think there is also, as I was mentioning, I think there is the issue, I think, of more superficial 
um, implementation. Um, there's budgetary issues in terms of uh, budgets not being prioritized uh, for gender equality. Um, there's also issues of, I think, I think it is a matter of priorities of like not every state is going to put their neck out there to push for women to be uh, actually substantively included and have a say in, in shaping a peace process, for example. Um, there's a lot of relegation of women to kind of advisory roles or consultative roles. Um, and I think then there's the persistent challenge of, of uh, the militarized structures that are really, um, there's, there's so much work that needs to be done to challenge those structures in the first place. Um, but then, uh, yeah, and I think that that shapes a lot of, a lot of the uh, work and, and that's a persistent obstacle. I think that, I think though this answer, this question could be answered in many different ways. I'm sure also locally speaking um, and nationally speaking, there, there are women who work on these issues in, in every country and they might have very different things to say. I think that there, these are trends that definitely pop up a lot. Um, and also the civic space restrictions that I was mentioning earlier of the intimidation, the repression of activism, um, and uh, retaliation and reprisals for um, for speaking out, um, including with cooperating with the UN, um, their uh, activists have faced reprisals. So I think those are those are definite challenges, and uh, you don't want to you don't want to put activists more at risk. Um, but then they also, you know, what they have to say is very important, and they want to say it. And um, I think it's about there's there's many many different uh, dynamics to this. Um, that I could speak about, but I hope that addresses the question. Thank you. So I'm going to ask Mary Beth Gardam to unmute herself and uh, speak about her question about corruption. Yes, I, I, I'm very aware that they're one of the reasons that women are not invited to be part of the uh, peace sustainability uh, plans after conflict is because uh, these areas are rife for black market corruption and uh, um, graft, and women probably would be less uh, anxious to participate that, in that and would uh, not accommodate it. So um, what, um, here in the United States where my committee is supporting an anti-corruption uh, act that is trying to address corruption at the United States city and state and federal level. Um, how can we support WILF International in doing the same kind of anti-corruption work in these countries where the conflict has stopped, but the crime and the, and the corruption is ramping up? I'll be honest, I can't speak as much to the corruption question. Um, I do know that there's, uh, t to some extent, I think that, you know, quote unquote, peace processes have often been, uh, in practice, processes for the people who have been fighting the war to kind of determine who ends up getting a say in the politics of the country and the economy of the country after the conflict. Um, and I think that that's the fundamental shift in power that we need. Um, we need to have people who have a vested interest in peace um, and in peaceful societies and inclusive societies actually at the table and deciding what the future of that country looks like and not these, not the people who, you know, have, have perpetuated violence and war and conflict and tremendous human rights violations uh, because they because they want to, because they have a vested interest in war and because they want to perpetuate that, but they end up get re getting rewarded by having a seat at the table when others don't. Um, so I don't know if I can speak as much to the corruption question specifically, but I think that it, um, yeah, per I think that it, it's that fundamental uh, imbalance of power um, of who actually gets hurt. Um, that is something that we definitely seek to disrupt. It's all part of the same uh, it's the other side of the coin, you know, um, those people who are um, trying to volley for power are also usually trying to profit from whatever uh, economic uh, decisions are made after afterwards. Right. Thank you. I, I was I was as you were talking about this was just thinking this is a good reason 
for more women to run for elected office uh, because as um, more women are elected, uh, they are more likely to be asked to be on these, uh, to come to the peace table. Uh, and hopefully those women will be less corruptible. Uh, along those lines, Robin has asked, who, who do you think, hoping Biden wins, who do you think Biden will appoint as UN ambassador from the US? Does, does anybody have any idea? Do you, has he uh, issued a list of people he might appoint? Or who would we like to have appointed? Okay. <laughs> Ray, do you have any idea? No, I don't. Uh, I don't have any idea. Genevieve, have you seen anything? I really don't either. Uh, a friend of mine was speculating that they think Pete Buttigieg might want it. <laughs> I don't know whether that uh, is just a funny guess or not, but I mean, all sorts of possibilities. Elizabeth Warren, I mean, I hope they don't recycle Susan Rice and uh, Samantha Powers, but who can tell? They might. Yeah, maybe maybe other people have, have good guesses for this. I would be interested in hearing. Yeah, okay. what do you think? Okay, well, uh, while people think about that, uh, uh, Nancy has another question. Uh, there is a, a new trade agreement which has been negotiated in, in secret, which is the U.S.-Kenya free trade agreement. And the U.S. hopes that the U.S. hopes will be the first of many with African states. Um, and it will be, she considers it will be a huge corporate push of big pharma, big agriculture, big IT into Africa. How can we work to turn that into a really fair trade agreement? Or should we work to defeat it? Or these or other free trade agreements that are being negotiated? Do either Ray or Genevieve have an opinion on free trade agreements with African countries? Well, I mean, what we've seen um, in the past from the U.S. negotiating these types of, of agreements with countries or with regions, it's extremely problematic. Um, I don't know anything specifically about this agreement. Um, and, you know, at, at the U.N. level, um, this isn't addressed because um, it's a bilateral relation. Um, but you know, what we, what we know from the past suggests that it's probably not um, going to be good. Um, and uh, I'd say that that's some, certainly something that the U.S. section could uh, look into doing advocacy around um, at the national level, um, for sure. And, and to my knowledge, Wilp U.S. has done advocacy around past um, U.S. Uh, free trade agreements, um, and it's great to do it where possible with the other countries that are involved. Um, so whether it's regions or, or a specific country. So WILP has um, a section in Kenya. So I think it could be a great action for the U.S. and Kenyan sections to, to work together on. But Genevieve, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. No, not really. I think that's a great suggestion. Um, and I think that um, finding more ways for sections to collaborate with each other on these kinds of things is a great idea. So uh, I don't see anybody has raised their hands uh, through the participant list. And I see there are a lot of uh, remarks in the chat box, which are mostly very helpful websites that we can go to to find out more about things that have been uh, said. Um, but that brought to mind a question from me that of course, oh, uh, we are intending in, in early December to have another webinar about the US military organization, which is called AFRICOM, A-F-R-I-C-O-M, which is, is trying to um, have a bigger military presence, a US presence in Africa. As we all know, the U.S. has about 800 bases abroad already. 
Um, so just to help us in our planning for that webinar, does Ray have anything to tell us about AFRICOM or where we might find out more about it? Absolutely. Um, so yeah, the biggest U.S. base in Africa right now is actually in the tiny country called Djibouti, and they have a massive base there. Um, many other countries have foreign military bases there as well, so it's quite colonized by foreign militaries. Um, but that's the base where the U.S. launches many of its drone strikes from in North Africa and the Middle East, um, so it's an incredibly important hub. Um, and they have U.S. troops as well as private military and security contractors working out of that base. Um, Wolf did a report, RCW did a report on that base and in particular looking at the sexual violence and gender-based violence of uh, women in Djibouti from soldiers stationed at the military bases there, not just from the U.S., but from, from all of the the um, foreign governments that have troops stationed in Djibouti. Um, so I can, I'll paste the link into the chat uh, for that. Um, but more broadly, um, I think one of the best sources for information on what the US is doing in Africa and with AFRICOM come from a writer called Nick Terse. He's an investigative journalist who works with The Intercept and The Nation and several other um, several other platforms. Uh, he's written several books about AFRICOM, but he's always actively investigating uh, new stories and leads. So I would encourage you to, to look up and share some of his resources maybe ahead of your, of your webinar. Um, and then hopefully, I don't know if you have plans to engage with the WILF, uh, US, or the WILF sections that are in Africa, but I'm sure many of them will have comments on what AFRICOM is up to in their countries. Yes, well, we, uh, Joy, who is the uh, uh, international president of uh, WILF, will be on that webinar. We're, we're trying to reach uh, women from other sections. There are like uh, 18 uh, sections in, in Africa of WILF. And that will be, I mean, I think really very exciting. And you can do it on a, you know, and talk with people on a Zoom call uh, to meet what, and find out what some of those um, sections are doing. And also we're collaborating with the Black Alliance for Peace and they have an, an extraordinary we uh, website, uh, US out of Africa, what's it, US, Afri AFRICOM out of Africa. And they are, um, one of their experts will be uh, a very important part of that uh, that webinar in December. So that's that's like a week before International Human Rights Day. It's on the 4th of uh, December. So I hope you'll all join in at that time. Can, can we now come back uh, to Robin's earlier question, which is uh, how can, uh, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, how can individual WILF members help reaching critical will and women, peace and security. Um, now, now we've appreciated just how few staff you have and what a wide range of topics you deal with. Can you tell us that, uh, you know, there's a place we can go to on your website and, and volunteer to help? Or what kind of expertise are you looking for in a volunteer? I know Volunteers can sometimes be a burden because we don't know enough. <laughs> so what, what kind of a person would you like to see uh, to, to come help you? Uh, Ray, why don't you go first? Um, sure. So right now, because of COVID, we're not really looking for... Um, too many, we usually do internships for um, uh, young folks who are either in school or have just graduated, um, but we're not really offering any of those because there's no way to get the experience that we can usually offer, which includes going to the UN and, and um, monitoring meetings and, and writing reports about that. So at the moment, we're just uh, monitoring what's what's available to monitor online and everything else has either been closed to us or has been postponed um, or canceled. So it's sort of our, 
are opportunities for people to really engage with the work at the UN um, is limited at the moment, unfortunately, but we'll certainly let all of you know when that changes again. Um, yeah, but most of the most of the other things we do um, just with the the staff that we have. But there's always, you know, we're always looking for people to collaborate with on projects, um, including in sections. Um, and so happy to hear ideas and different ways that we can work together on things. Uh, Genevieve, do you have an answer? Yeah, I guess I'll say kind of similarly. I think what. Um, I, I don't think we've had volunteers since my time at Wolf, so I'm not sure if it was a different situation previously. Um, but I think that's definitely an interesting thing to discuss, especially if the situation changes a little bit uh, with COVID. Um, but I, I will also uh, echo that I think that we're always looking for more opportunities to collaborate. And um, I think there's, you know, also as, you know, I'm personally American, um, I'm interested in also, you know, like understanding what work you're doing on the national level, because, you know, that is, that's my country that affects me too. And it affects many, many people. Um, so uh, I would definitely be interested in finding more ways to collaborate and I can uh, get back to you about, uh, uh, about the volunteering thing. I would have to speak with my colleague, but um, thank you for bringing that up. Right. So I'm, I'm now, I'm seeing a few more questions coming up in the chat. <clears throat> Mary Beth says uh, she has been talking to Asa Miller from Norway section and they've been holding encouraging conferences with peace activists in Russia. Is there anything Wolf is doing to try to disarm the rhetoric with Russia and the US? <coughs> so we see a lot of things in the media. Um, people U.S. is saying that, you know, um, Russia is doing all these bad things and vice versa. Is there anything Wolf can do at the grassroots level to, to tamper that down? Ray? I don't see Ray. Um, oh, well, maybe, maybe she had to go. She seems to have dropped off. Okay. Maybe she lost internet somehow. I, I think it's starting to rain, so it could be because of that. Um, oh, oh dear. <laughs> uh, the internet is very, uh, very weird in New York lately. Um, I guess I can, I can try to address this really quickly. I think that that's a great, um, that's a, an area that it would be good to kind of expand on in terms of, you know, we do not have a section in Russia. Um, and it would be amazing if we did. But of course, there's, um, there's a lot more restrictions on civil society. We have colleagues in Ukraine. Um, and so Wilf does have a project on uh, women mobilizing for change uh, and peace in Ukraine. Um, and so that, of course, is related to Russia. Um, but I think that it's, this is an interesting area to, uh, to explore further. And I'm not sure if I have suggestions of exactly what to do, but I think it's, it's important to also note that, you know, over the past four years during the Trump administration, um, in the Security Council, the U.S. has been a bit rogue, you know, like it used to be aligning a little bit more with um, some of the European members of the council um, and the non-permanent members, and from what I understand, um, and now it's, uh, it has been pushing a lot against, you know, sexual and, re uh, sexual and reproductive rights um, and has been, you know, al aligning in really weird ways, and so I think that that, we'll see what happens with the election um, in terms of what, whether that will, what will shift in terms of uh, the, the geopolitical dynamics as well. Uh, I think we're all on the edge of our seats mm -hmm. um, and hopefully making some calls. <laughs> okay, so I see some other questions that would, been, would have been addressed by Ray. Has she come back, Ellen? Or did we lose her? I don't see. I had asked I had asked her earlier about the NPT review. So we were told that it was postponed till probably January. Uh, but her opinion is it's unlikely to happen in January because it is the kind of review where delegates really do need to talk to each other. Delegates from different countries are discussing important policy shifts or policies. It's not the kind of thing you do on Zoom. And at the moment, if you look at web 
the UN's own web TV where many of their committees and goings on are broadcast, you will see only one delegate per country in the General Assembly and they're all spread out and when they get to leave, there's a voice that says, okay, countries A to F can now leave. You know, they're being very particular. So she, she's of the opinion that the MPT review will not happen in January. I, I you know, so, so that, that's where we're at with that. I guess uh, I can speak quickly about CSW because yes, Robin yes, asked certainly. about that yes. earlier. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so at the moment, they are saying that it could happen in person, uh, which I highly doubt um, because I... That would be in April? It would be in March. Um, March. They, yeah, it's saying that it's planned to occur in New York um, in March. I, I think what is likely is that it will be um, best case scenario. Uh, there will be governments and then it could be New York-based civil society. Um, in which case, WILP would not be able to get the passes for uh, for members that we typically would, um, because typically we have a number of passes, and then we also uh, ask other organizations that we are like allied with that uh, don't use their passes. We ask them for passes, and then they donate them to WILP, and so then that's how we're able to bring a lot of members to CSW. Um, so I, my suspicion is that it will be online. Um, and I'm not sure if any of you have been following, maybe not because um, more of you are involved in the disarm committee, but um, some of the Beijing plus 25 meetings, those have had kind of, um, I don't know, a varying level of participation. I think they've been trying to have some level of participation online via chat and um, inviting CSOs to speak, but it's not it's not exactly the same as uh, all being together in person. But I will definitely be reaching out uh, with updates about that and we'll be posting what, whatever we know um, we will be sharing with all of you. Okay. Again, I, I, I have a, a question about the global ceasefire. I feel it's um, kind of uh, diminished and gone out of uh, public awareness but I, I think it's such an important idea. And um, what we're doing here in Burlington, I've written up just a little statement, a letter to um, Antonio Gutierrez, the Secretary General saying, thank you. And, and you know, we're entering um, the, third, um, the third wave of the virus. And this is so, your, your statement back in March is so important. And so thank you getting people to sign it and then s mailing it to him uh, with some Vermont maple syrup because we're from Vermont and we want to be sweet and so on. But I mean, you know, trying to take a gesture to let him know that he's done something fantastic. Uh, and so us in the grassroots, let's respond. Let's send him our love however we can do it. So. <laughs> I have a statement for it, which I, I don't know how to get it onto the uh, onto onto the chat box. Do you just well anyway? Someone can tell me. Type it in. Type where well, it says type message here, and it says put it to everyone. Type message here. So but, can you tell us, uh, Genevieve? Does does Amazon deliver things to the UN building? If if Robin was to send her. her Bottles of maple syrup to the have, secretary. C care of Amazon. No idea. I have no idea. <laughs> that's a, that's an excellent question. Because it seems to me they have to be getting mail. Uh, that uh, you know a lot of uh, business, so to speak, is carried out through through post the post. So I would have hoped not that to have anybody personally deliver it, but to have it delivered by a regular delivery service. I think you should look into that. Now, D Dennis Nelson is asking, and again, this may have been a Ray question, is anyone dealing with the nuclear contamination of the environment by sunken Russian submarines and the development and testing of nuclear powered cruise missiles in the Arctic? Has anybody any knowledge about that? I'm afraid I call? don't, unfortunately. No. Uh, I heard that uh, there were peop countries had bases around the edge of the Arctic, military bases which they had, had mothballed, 
and I understand they're beginning to open them up again. Um, so Dennis, why did you ask that question? Do you have a suspicion about it? Are you, no, I, I, I'm just wondering what, what the United Nations are, is doing and what NGOs are doing to pressure the United Nations to make them remediate this mess that they're making instead of making more cruise missiles, which also are highly polluting, radioactively polluting. Right. So, so these sunken Russian submarines you're talking about, are, were they nuclear powered? Yes. And, and, and they were deliberately they? sunk in the Arctic, uh, in, oh. in the northern part of Russia. Because why? Just to get rid of them. Okay, they were out of... They were out of service and they just wanted to cheaply uh, decommission them, so they just sunk them. And they're they contaminating didn't... the Arctic and the food, the food supply, the fish and things in the, in the I would have Arctic. Thought, I would have thought they would have taken the nuclear reactor out of them first. Uh, I don't think so. Okay. So, no. we, unfortunately, we don't have a, a question, an answer to that. Uh, let's yeah. see. Any, any other things in the chat? Um, so Mary Beth says, thank you both so much for your patient persistence and commitment. It must be frequently depressing to see how long change takes and how much opposition there is, especially from the US. Please know you are standing up for quite a lot of us mm -hmm. and we send you our admiration and support. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you, Mary Beth, very nicely put. Thank um, you. And, and I know that's, that's very mutual. And uh, I know that uh, I, I definitely speak for throughout this panel, I've spoken just as myself, but I know I speak for all of the Wilf Secretariat staff that um, we, we do what we're doing because of the wonderful Wilf members who are behind us and whose work that we are, we're trying to push up into these uh, multilateral spaces. So uh, thank you all for all you're doing, you know, whether it's on militarization, on disarmament, on border issues, on what all of it, uh, it's very important. And um, uh, yeah, so it's very appreciated. 